So welcome to an evening of serious hope. So what is that? Uh, it is taken off the idea that hope in itself is not enough. Hope and direction is serious hope. And I can think of no other place in some ways than the Ideas Festival so full of people trying to share that sense of serious hope, that sense of direction. And as I was thinking about this earlier this year, I was thinking about what to present tonight and what might be an interesting way to start the festival, I thought about that idea of serious hope and how it underpins all of our lives if we go back. I remember uh, how I started. One of the questions I get asked the most is, when did you know, I was a dancer, for those of you who don't know, when did you know that you wanted to be a dancer? I was 11. I was 11. That was a moment of serious hope. It went from, God, it might be nice if I did this, that, and the other, to, you know what? I can do this. I see the path. There it is. And it came from there to, I'm going to move to New York to do that, to, I also want to do this, to that, to the other. And in my current life, when I was fortunate enough to become the president of Juilliard in 2018, coming off of seven extraordinary years creating an arts policy program here at the Aspen Institute, I found my serious hope in taking an institution that is prided on tradition, prided on accomplishment and excellence, and thinking that tradition is driving innovation, and trying to build that sense of purpose, that forward motion, which has now culminated in a serious hope to take that hallowed institution tuition free. That is serious hope. That is saying there's a direction and a place to go and to bring people with you. So as you go through these days, I like to think of this actually as a little bit of a benediction. This is a serious hope benediction for these next days because you're going to hear things that inspire you from people who want you to take that direction forward. And tonight on this session, I'm joined with some of my my partners in driving innovation, in driving tradition forward. Uh, we're going to be joined shortly by Chris Bowers, pianist, composer, filmmaker, extraordinaire, Juilliard alum, two degrees. Uh, and we're going to talk with Chris about the serious hope of intersecting culture and education in his life and how he's trying to share that most recently through his Oscar-winning short documentary, The Last Repair Shop, uh, which if you haven't seen, you're going to see a little clip, and you're going to go home tonight, and you're going to watch it, I promise you. Uh, we'll then be joined by Renee Fleming, one of the greatest, <laughs> greatest sopranos in history, someone who has redefined what the voice can be, and someone who has taken that forward as an advocate, in so many different ways, and most especially in recent times, pushing forward the connections, as the title of her most recent book, uh, Music and Mind, says, about science and nature and art and our own humanity and how these things intersect in that spirit of serious hope, that underpinning that it is not simply feeling good, but it is about driving towards progress. Finally, we'll be joined by Mitch Landrew, the great late mayor of New Orleans, <laughs> former lieutenant governor of Louisiana, special assistant to President Biden over these last years for infrastructure, and someone who has culture not only in his career path, someone who took culture as uh, the pride of New Orleans, about the unifying structure of New Orleans, but also as the signatory of who we are as people and how we have control over that as he oversaw the dismantling of Confederate monuments and believed and saw how this culture was not something that was ornamental, but something that was fundamental. So in that spirit of serious hope, let's get started. Please join me in welcoming Chris Bowers to the stage. <laughs> oh, thank you, thank you. Please sit. Thank you. So Chris, you know, we're framing this, you heard that, 
and we've talked about this in different ways. Yeah. But what does that mean to you? Does it harken back to, to music, or does it go further back? Or, you know, you seem like a fairly directional guy uh, <laughs> from Los Angeles. Yeah. Uh, tell the story. You know, where does, this, where does this come from? Yeah, so, I mean, I definitely feel like my directional sensibility came from my parents. They decided before I was born they wanted me to play piano. Um, <laughs> they were a little the opposite of most parents wanting me to be an artist to a certain point. It's funny because I found out when I decided I wanted to go to a conservatory, all of a the sudden they were like, oh wait, we wanted you to do this so you can get into a real school and study something real and get a scholarship. We didn't want you to actually become a musician. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and it wasn't until I got into Juilliard that they were like, okay, Juilliard, I guess we'll, we'll let you do that. Um, but, you know, they weren't musicians, but from the time I was you know, in the womb, they were putting music on my mom's stomach. They started piano when I was four. Uh, they put me in, um, when I was eight or nine, they put me in private piano lessons, uh, classical piano, and I wasn't really responding to that. And they talked to different right. people. Slide what was the music in the womb? What were you listening to? What's really interesting, it was basically like, Classical music bought at the grocery store. It uh -huh. was like pretty, you know, uh, new agey, simple kind of music. But what's really fascinating to me is a lot of the music that I create now uh, as a film composer has like a similarity to some of that music. Which you guys were listening to Bridgerton season one, by the way, when you came in. <laughs> <Yeah. But. laughs> um, and so when I was eight or nine, they were really smart in that they. Um, talk to enough people to understand that even though I wasn't responding to classical music, um, they wanted to put me in jazz because they thought that might be something I would connect to more, but they kept me in classical lessons because they knew that that would be great for my foundation and my technique and all of that. And so by the time I was nine, I was going to Colburn for jazz piano, classical piano, music theory, and jazz band um, every week. And my parents would talk to my teachers and, and all of that. And by the time I was 12, similar to you, my parents were asking me, like, what are you doing with your life? Like, what are you going to do when you go to college? What are you going to do after that? And it was by that point that I already had figured out because of my relationship with the piano and to film music and all of this that I wanted to go to school for jazz piano, I wanted to become a jazz artist, and I wanted to find a way to transition into film scoring. And that's something that I talked about from the time I was 12 until I found a way to make that happen. That's incredible. So the, that sense of purpose was there by the time you were 12 seems like even before, but you found your direction at 12. This is like, that's where I know I'm going. And her parents were like, wait, really? Uh, let's, and probably they waited it out, but it, it didn't change, did it? No. It got deeper. Yeah, exactly. I read so yeah. many things that talked about not having a backup plan, because then I would yes. you know, end up falling back By on being that. a dancer. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, I can imagine. That, you know that's going to end. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, for sure. So uh, thinking about that sense of fundamentals. I want to hone in on that a little bit. That's very interesting to me. It's building off of the fundamentals, building off of kind of the tradition, and thinking about some of your early success as a uh, composer of Green Book, which had a historical basis, mm -hmm. you know? How, did that, how does that appeal to you? It seems to me that you always have this kind of yin and yang going on, where you're like, yep, I know this, and this is where I'm going. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I think for me, I, I'm always looking to study something to see how it's going to expand my approach to my craft, expand the way that I think about my craft. And so with something like Green Book, the thing that I had never heard of Don Shirley before, uh, before they asked me to read the script and consider being a part of the film. And it was my responsibility to not only study his music, but, but be a big part of selecting which pieces of his would be in the film. And then I had to transcribe those to record them and, and place them in the film. And then I'm the piano, I'm playing piano and they put Mahershala's head on my body. And so for me, as soon as I knew what the, the assignment was gonna be, there was a part of me that felt like, um, not only do I feel like this is gonna be so incredibly important for me in terms of what it's gonna do for my own ability as a pianist, my ability as a composer, and all of that, but I also had a feeling that like, uh, sadly, like not everybody wants to go that deep in certain industries, and I had a fear that somebody in his music in somebody else's hand might not be taken as, as seriously or somebody might not go as deep. And so there's a part of me that was like, I kind of have to be a part of this because I know that I'm gonna like, 
sweat over every single note as I'm transcribing it and make sure like I transcribed the bass parts for the bass player to play just because I really wanted to represent his music as best as possible. Um, and I feel like that approach is the same approach I bring to whether it's Don Shirley or it's me studying, you know, Radiohead or Stravinsky or Kendrick Lamar, like that same level of respect and, and attention to detail uh, exists kind of across the board. Being in the storytelling business, because you are, as a, as a film composer and now as a documentary maker, you have a, such a sense of narrative. We've been fortunate to have you at Juilliard working with us over the last years, uh, including a film scoring lecture with Nick Bertel, where you revealed your software, which I, even Nick was like, wow, that is detailed. <laughs> you take that sense of, uh, of knowledge, and uh, that's the, to me, that's the serious and serious hope. Mm. It's not just that you do feel these things. You actually put that work into it and drive it forward. Talk a little bit about you know, how you hope that the intersection of education and direction, you know, not just how it worked for you, but I'm kind of bridging to the documentary now, you know, that this becomes a, a purpose-driven uh, situation. Yeah, well, I think that, like, you know, when you find something that you connect with on such a deep level that time kind of disappears, then there's nobody needs to tell you to practice or to work hard or to have that seriousness in terms of working toward this dream, you know, and so I feel like for me, the only reason why I'm a musician is because I discovered that I could translate and transmute these emotions that I couldn't articulate verbally, like anger and sadness and uh, anything, anxiety, like these things that I couldn't really express at home or in school. Um, I figured out that I could be angry and play piano from an angry place. And it was this secret communication between me and this instrument that created this feedback loop. And 30 minutes later, I didn't feel as angry anymore. And that is the reason why I play music. And so many of the students we talked to in our, our film in The Last Repair Shop, at whether they're eight or 18, recognize that connection to their instrument and recognize that they are playing on a daily basis half because they want to get better and half because they kind of need to, half because they, they feel this, um, this cathartic release when they're doing this musical thing. And so I feel like um, so much of that connection to something that you have this visceral relationship with creates that uh, work ethic and that, that you know, consistency that it takes to become whatever it is that you're trying to become. Yeah, so that's the, that sense of need to as well as like to, which I think is so important. I certainly had that as a dancer. Mm. I needed to get to class. I needed it for lots of reasons, but it was also the place where it was my church. It mm -hmm. was like where I could find that inner dialogue. So the, the film, the documentary, The Last Repair Shop, focuses uh, on that wonderful structure in LA, which provides free instruments in, in the LA Unified School District, of which you uh, partook. Yes, yeah, and, and LA is one of the last cities in the country to provide free and freely repaired music instruments for their public school students. Uh, most major cities across the country don't do that anymore, and it's really amazing that LA still has this program, and every year there are now, at this point, over 100,000 instruments that are in circulation in LAUSD schools, and there are only 12 technicians that are responsible for all 100,000 of those instruments, um, and they're split between departments, so there's, you you know, two brass technicians and like three piano technicians and so on and so forth. Um, and so we, uh, when my co-director Ben Proudfoot told me about it, we were actually working on another film of ours called A Concerto a Conversation about me and my grandfather. And at the same time, he found out about this repair shop and he was like, well, Chris, you grew up here in LA, you must know about this. And not only did I not know about this repair shop, I reflected on the fact that when I was a kid, I never thought about how my instruments were being repaired. Like, I played piano, I played saxophone for a short while in middle school, and if my saxophone was broken, I thought I was going back to the manufacturer or, you know, yeah. somewhere else, and I was, you know, when it came back, I was like, great, they fixed it. Or the piano, if it was out of tune one day and it was in tune the next day, I was like, great, it's in tune, and never thought about the invisible hands that were making sure that happened, and so when he told me about this repair shop, for me, it felt like a way to connect to this, this place that had an impact, an invisible impact in me becoming who I am, and even found out that the piano technician repaired the pianos in my elementary school and middle school, uh, and so it was a chance to connect with him, and, and it really became this moment to lift up these stories. That's beautiful. All right, so we're going to show a very short clip uh, from the last repair shop now. Do uh, you want to set it up for us? Yes, yeah, so this is a, a young student named Amanda, and you know the thing that I really loved about her, she's a pianist, and she speaks to some of those things I was just talking about in terms of why 
so many young people need music in terms of uh, you know finding self confidence, self discipline, or whatever else it might be. And for her, you know, after we we actually shot the film, her her father uh, that she speaks about passed away. And in in all the conversations, there are a handful of students we we meet in the film. I was reminded in interviewing them how much. You know, I kind of thought when I interviewed them, like, what does this eight-year-old know about, you know, struggle or hardship? Or does this 12-year-old know about, you know, what life, how, how hard life can be? And in these conversations, it just was such a clear reminder that, uh, you know, life is difficult at any age, at any time of life, and also at the same time, especially now for some of these young people. And so Amanda, I feel like it's such a great representation for, you know, putting all of that into her music. Beautiful. Let's roll the clip. When I was three years old, my dad taught me how to play Twinkle, Twinkle Little Star on the piano. I actually vividly remember that. I've been playing the piano for like nine years now. You know, I just have a connection with it, you know? I'm getting emotional. I've just been playing for a while, playing for a long time. Mental health is something that's like very hard to manage sometimes, especially with like everything that's going on in your life, like school and thinking of what you want to be. It's very stressful sometimes. I guess I'm just scared of like failure, you know? Like I'm scared like I won't like find a purpose in life. But once I go on stage, all that tension goes away. When you play on stage, you have like this overwhelming presence. And like, you know, the audience is like somewhat like attracted to it, you know? Everyone's just watching you. And you feel a certain power. Something like that. <laughs> so I can only imagine the relationships you made with these kids. And when you see the film, you'll see all the generations of people involved uh, that come together in a piece that Chris composed at the end, uh, which really brought it together. Uh, that idea of hope, when we talked about this session uh, and we talked about what you might, what you might share, uh, you mentioned, well, I actually wrote a piece called Hope uh, <laughs> uh, back when you were at Juilliard. You want to tell us about that? Yeah, um, so I think it, it kind of came around um, a certain time in my life. It was when Obama was running for his first presidency and, uh, you know, that whole campaign that was built around this idea of hope. And it was the first presidency that I voted in, and so it was a big deal for me. I think also for me, there's something about um, hope that I've always uh, connected with. Like, I think that, you know, through whatever might have happened in my life in different parts of my life, I've always been a a person that leans a little bit more toward the hopeful side of things or the more optimistic side of things. And I think a lot of it's just like, you know, I feel very fortunate for how my life has turned out. And I think a lot of how my life has turned out is because I've been optimistically, you know, uh, focused or, or oriented toward it. And so, you know, him building his whole campaign around that idea really just resonated with me on an even deeper level. And so it was not only a piece that I wrote about that, but it was also the first piece that I ever wrote that I orchestrated with a small chamber ensemble. And, you know, this is at Juilliard, and I, I convinced a bunch of 18 and 19 year olds to play this piece and record it for pizza, which never would happen again in my life, which <laughs> I wish I appreciated more when I was there. And then I played it for my senior recital, uh, and it's a place that I, a piece that I still play uh, to this day. Yeah. All right. So, well, before you play, I want to just call out that. A measure of serious hope is how you invest yourself in things. And you can see how Chris is invested in that direction. Uh, but coming off of the last repair shop, he's taken it one step further and he started a campaign to make that last repair shop ever more uh, in Los Angeles to build on it. You want to talk about that? How's that going? Yeah, so we announced a $15 million uh, capital campaign 
to endow this repair shop and, and have it be, uh, you know, in a fixture in this community forever, essentially. And it's something that we worked with LAUSD and their education foundation and the shop itself to figure out what number would, would be helpful for them. Also recognizing that, you know, a lot of the arts funding that has come into LA goes to the classroom and there's this weird divide where it might pay for new instruments and pay for teachers, but it actually doesn't pay for the repair of those instruments or doesn't pay for a new case or any of that kind of stuff. And so this repair shop actually still needs this support. And for us, it's just so important that that doesn't become privatized so that you know in, any student that wants to play an instrument in LA will be able to do that and doesn't have to worry that if their instrument breaks that you know it'll also continue to be taken care of. Well, I guarantee when you see the film, you will want that to happen for them mm -hmm. because it makes all the difference. It makes all the difference. All right, Chris, will you give us a little hope? Yeah, definitely. All right.
Chris Bowers, Clyde of the LA Unified School District, <laughs> Juilliard. Yes. So great, man. Thank you. Okay, Chris is going to hang out because uh, you're in for a treat because this is the kind of thing that happens when two Juilliard alums get together, Renee Fleming and Chris <laughs> Bowers. You get an email late at night that says, hey, you want to play for Renee Fleming tomorrow? Um, sure. You know, what's the key? Let's go. R please welcome Renee Fleming. Hello, friend. It's so beautiful. Wow. Wasn't that? I felt. I felt. Isn't that an amazing gift? Ah. Deep notes. Deep notes. And then it ends on joy. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So um, we're going to do a couple of selections from something I'm touring right now. Um, I realized during the pandemic, and actually for years, I've been thinking about the fact that most of the music that has been the core of my repertoire is late 19th century, early 20th century uh, music. And the Poetry, in particular, in song literature, frames every human emotion through the lens of nature. Just everything. You know, if love's not going well, the rose is wilted. If love's going great, the, the rose is blooming, and on and on and on. And lots of, I'm in the woods and I'm crying, and so is the trees are crying as well, and the moon is out, of course. So I, I just thought, God, that's interesting. And, the new, and, and yet, I, we don't do that now. So I thought during the pandemic to create a program that sort of juxtaposed that period with our relationship to nature now. So we had five new commissions. This was a project with Yannick Nézé-Séguin, who's music director of the Met. And uh, it won a Grammy last year, so I was so happy about that. And surprise. Thank you. So, and I thought, let's take it on the road. Let, let's be adventurous, and, um, but I wanted media. I wanted to, to show our relationship to nature. And it's called Voice of Nature, the Anthropocene, was the name of the project. And uh, I, at a dinner party, I have, I have this luck with dinner parties. I met um, a CEO of a company and started telling him about this project. And he said, oh, I can introduce you to, this, to the CEO of National Geographic. I didn't even know National Geographic is based in Washington, DC, where I live. So um, I met him. I, I had three minute Zoom call. And he said, yeah, we'll make your films. Done. <laughs> So very, just luck, just incredible luck. And I've been touring that all year so far, um, and I'll hopefully keep doing it. So we're going to do two selections from that. One is a Hazel Dickens song. Does anybody know who she is? So West Virginia, um, really roots country, uh, so much about that, that period of time, and a plaintive, incredible sound. Uh, so this is some um, uh, Fly Away that starts. And then Bjork did a beautiful album called Biophilia, which was very much connected to, to nature and all of the media that she had to go with it. And the sounds and the, and the textures are the same. So I did that with orchestra. But both of these pieces are in this, this project. So you'll get to get a taste of it and see two films. And I'm so excited that Chris has agreed to play the first one, um, for which I don't actually have a track. So here we go. Fly away, little pretty bird. Fly away, fly away, little pretty bird. And pretty you will always stay Fly far beyond the dark mountains To where you'll be free
don't Thank you, Chris. You're so beautiful. Thank you. Oh. No Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Renee. Wow. That just took us to very high places and <laughs> underwater and everywhere. You know, yeah, please. No, no, no. I just, it was so fun to put this together, and it's about 30 minutes. And then they, they also, National Geographic has a whole piece, too, that they play uh, to a, a Jackson Brown song that I recorded with Alison Krauss and Rhiannon Giddens called Before the Deluge, which is a mm. perfect fit for climate. Uh, it's, I know it was composed, actually, for a potential nuclear attack, but it, it was, uh, it, the words equally apply to climate. That's amazing. Uh, so the roots of this project go way back. Um, I understand that when you were 14, you saw a sci-fi film that took place in the dystopian future uh, of 2022 uh, when uh, we'd ruined it. We'd ruined the planet. Pollution and all the other uh, man-made catastrophes uh, took us to a place. But then within the film, there's a great moment that you remembered all these years later. Well, you know, it's like great pieces of music. I always remember where I was when I first heard them. And by the way, I did not want to be a musician. You know, no. and I did not want to do what I'm doing. I, was, I just wasn't in my nature. Uh -huh. I wanted to be first lady president. 
Yeah, sadly, nobody else has done that yet. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Still time. We got to get, you know, we have to yeah. get that done. Do. Uh, anyway, I, I was so struck by this film as a teenager when Ed, Edward G. Uh, Robinson. Robinson, who I didn't know was dying, no, we didn't, nobody knew he died right after he made the film, uh, was in this death scene, and, this, in, in, and he was actually, uh, in order to, in, by giving up his body, he was able to sit and listen to, which I, I thought all these years, I thought it was the Alpine Symphony of Strauss. It was something yeah. a little bit different than that, but similar. And see these incredible pictures of Alps and, and beautiful scenes in nature, but of course none of that existed at the time. And I just thought, how, it just terrified me. I thought, how is that possible? How is that, how could that possibly happen? So, it, and, and never, it was one of those things that just was stayed with me. Yeah. And I went back and looked at it, because I thought, this is a great inf- inspiration for the project, and I was stuck. I was shocked to see that it was 2022. Yeah. You know, that there was nothing left. Incredible. Yeah. Well, you took that forward uh, and made it of today with commissions by today's composers. Uh, and we'll get to hear from you talking a little bit about that later on in the festival, about opera in particular. And uh, I, wanna, I wanna call out your advocacy that, I mean, the first time I ever got to work with you was uh, in a school in Chicago. Uh, and since then, we've done lots of different things at Kennedy Center and elsewhere. You've devoted your time and your energy and your effort to finding the way that you can take sound the human voice in many cases, but also simply art, into a place of forward motion. Uh, how did that come about? Was that, I mean, I guess it was there before you when you said you wanted to be the first uh, lady president. You had a mission uh, of making that sort of forward motion. Yeah, I think in this case, um, I had issues myself. I had somatic pain. I had uh, stage fright. I had some, you know, physical issues with with performing, with the pressure of performing. I was not a natural performer. I had to kind of learn it. And um, so uh, I suddenly noticed that scientists were studying the brain and music. And I thought, and so then I kept reading about that. I was interested in the mind-body connection. Mm -hmm. This was at a time, actually, earlier in my career when when medicine was not really acknowledging that. So... um, I met Dr. Francis Collins at a dinner party. There, see, that's the other one. And I said, why are scientists studying the brain? And he said, well, we have, a, we have an initiative at the NIH, National Institutes of Health, that it, it seeks to, to kind of figure out the most complex object in the known universe, the brain. And music is in every mapped area, so, so far a mapped area of the brain. It's, it's incredibly complex, what we have to do to process music, especially if we're engaged with it actively, and um, it activates uh, more parts of the brain than really almost any other activity. So uh, I said, well, I just started as a consultant at the Kennedy Center. I think the audience would be fascinated to hear about this. Can we provide a platform for the science? And so not only have we done that, but they have now spent $40 million actually paying for research uh, at the NIH for music in the brain, which was unheard of before then. It was referred to as soft science. It wasn't taken seriously. And nobody says that now. Uh, and of course, visual arts are p- impactful. Dance has now been added to, to the whole thing because of movement disorders. So they are now going to fund dance. You know, and of course, dance is always paired with music, almost always. Well, this, the serious hope in that is so so clear. You know, when I think about it, I think about the kind of the the fundamental support that it provides when we think about how we we have intrinsic knowledge of these type of things, but then to actually put the data to work, to figure out, to get the people inspired to take it forward uh, so that we can actually put it to use in serious ways. We're deeply in your debt. Well, there's a lot already um, for, for certainly for types of dementias, for Parkinson's, uh, for movement disorders like Parkinson's and... Yeah and other things, but also for childhood development, pain is a huge area. I mean, I had a girlfriend who had a brain bleed, and she, um, they said, you know, don't look at screens, stay in the dark. Okay, you could listen to music. The only music that alleviated her agony was Jimi Hendrix as loud as she could possibly play it. And, you know, and if the volume went down or it stopped, the pain came flooding back. So I sent this to all the neurologists that I work with on this, and they said, they, and they sent me a study that showed pictures of, 
of what pain looks like in an fMRI in one spot, and the same, same person, a minute later, listening to music, and all of the red lines were gone. So there, there, were just, there are powerful things about how we engage with the arts, which we just felt with Chris's playing. Uh, I did, anyway. Um, and why it's so important to keep that in schools, because kids need to be ex able to express themselves and find their own identities, and artistic means are really helpful for that. Expression. Well, we, we heard the, the young lady uh, talking about what the piano meant to her uh, and how that, it's, we know it. We all know it. We know why we care about a, a child's drawing on the refrigerator. It's not mysterious. What, what we don't seem to be able to grasp is how to invest in that in serious ways. Uh, and that's what, what, what you're doing in all of your work in this area is to point the way. So, Renee, we're so grateful. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much. We're going to welcome Mitch Landrew up, and uh, we'll see you in a, in a moment. So, Mitch and I have uh, shared the stage here before in Aspen, uh, actually out in this garden, uh, talking about the influence of, of art on, uh, on society, on community building. Uh, and we've, we've shared the stage at Juilliard as well. Uh, and in fact, I'm feeling a little like I should have thought ahead because we've got a Juilliard uh, alum over here. We've got another one over there. What are we gonna do? Do I have to get you an honorary doctorate now? Is that the story? Uh, uh, yes. Okay, we'll, we'll talk about that. But uh, I know you're, uh, you always wanted to major in drama, so we can maybe that's Well, I just heard, there. Renee, first of all, it's so great to be with you. Thank you for everything. It's it's really wonderful. But I heard her say she, she didn't really want to do what she's doing. She wanted to be president. Well, I didn't want to do what I'm doing. I wanted to be a famous singer. So I find myself working in the White House. Maybe we could work a deal and just switch it up a little bit. You, you've, I've heard you say that art is not the cherry on top. Talk about that a little bit. Yeah, well, the, for, when, yeah. I, when I was, uh, you know, you asked a question uh, a little bit earlier. When did you know, you know, that you were interested in music? You know, and I remember exactly where I was. I was in seventh grade. We, uh, I went to St. Matthias Parochial School. A new nun came that year, and uh, we all tried out for the Christmas cantata. And uh, she said to me, she said, hey, kid, you have a pretty good voice. Would you like to sing a solo at the Christmas cantata? And I said, yeah. And I sang, it came upon a midnight clear, and the audience stood up, and I really liked that. <laughs> and I went, wow. And that same year, for some reason, I went to go see the musical Oliver, uh -huh. And I saw West Side Story in the same year. And I said, you know what? That's what I want to do with my life. And I really wanted to be a professional actor and singer and dancer. Uh -huh. uh, and I went to um, Jesuit High School. They had a great theater department. Uh, I did a bunch of shows there. I got my equity card when I was 16. I took voice lessons from two uh, graduates from Juilliard. Uh, and I went to Catholic University of America. One of the reasons why I went um, was to go to the Harkey Theater Conservatory. And I did a bunch of shows there. And I did a USO tour. Um, but I was also in government as well. And I did a whole bunch of stuff. And uh, I remember the moment when I realized that I was not going to be a professional performer. Uh, I had gone to New York to audition um, for a couple of shows. And I showed up. And there were 300 guys standing in line in front of me. They were all taller better looking, they sang better than me, and they had hair. And I thought, you know what? Uh, I should listen to my father, because he said, kid, if you go to law school, I'll pay you away. And if you want to go back, you know, you can do that. And I wound up meeting my, the woman who was going to be my wife in law school. Um, but throughout my entire um, life, music has been a part of it. It was an important part of it. And I remember uh, having the pain of having all of my friends um, who were great at what they did, having to leave New Orleans to make a living. Mm. And I thought about our great city um, and thank everybody for helping, but um, one of the things we do that's just terrible, and this is part of the great migration that took place, you know, you, the book Cast, Isabel Wilkerson has written, I think one of the finest books uh, in the history, and it, it's called The Warmth of Other Sons. And if you wanna get a sense of how much raw talent, raw material and intellectual capital left the South, to go someplace else to curate whatever it is they were gonna do, become doctors, lawyers, great musicians, think Went Marcellus, who left New Orleans, think Louis Armstrong, think Terrence Blanchard, think Trombone Shorty, keep going on and on. But when you export all of your intellectual capital and all of your creative talent, and somebody adds value to it and then tries to sell it back to you for more, it gets to be a problem. 
and you began to see the great loss. And so I wanted to make sure that if I was ever in a position, I would make sure that they had a chance to stay in New Orleans to do their work. Hence, out of that came a lot of work uh, to create the New Orleans Center for Creative Art, which is like the mini Juilliard that we now have that produces incredible artists. Um, I then found myself, I had been a legislator for 16 years. I ran for Lieutenant Governor. And the Lieutenant Governor in Louisiana is responsible for the Department of Culture, Recreation, and Tourism. And at the time, culture, recreation, and tourism meant this sleepy little passive thing that people did. But my idea was to create something that we called the cultural economy, which was to get people focused on the back of the house side of art, music, and historic preservation, and actually go to the budget table and say to them, I understand that y'all are giving all those tax breaks to the oil and gas industry, and I understand you have to do that, but have you ever thought about how many jobs there are in the state of Louisiana in that little frame? And it turned out that we had 215,000 jobs in art, music, historic preservation, and tourism, and that the, the return on investment was 16 to 1. And so that's why I started to tell people, you know, art's not just a cherry on top. You know, normally, go get a big company to come in and tell them the symphony's there, or Renee's coming to sing, and it'll be a good thing, and your families will want to come locate your company there. Mm -hmm. And I said, yeah, that's really nice. I said, but what, what would happen if we just started investing in the arts, and we started creating lots of jobs and lots of music, and the artists learned how to be good businessmen and women and understood that the value of their ideas that could be copyrighted here would actually make sense. How do you create that? And we'd be able to work a lot uh, on that. On top of that, you, for everybody, you, you know this, this is, uh, it's great that we're doing the research and the studies, we need it so that we can prove it to people. But I have, I have yet to meet a person in my life that doesn't like music. I know people that don't like football. <laughs> I like it. But I know people that actually don't like to ballet. But I don't know anybody that doesn't like music. And I'm sure that both of these performers have had the same experience that I've had is that when you're performing on stage, whatever play it is, and you look out into an audience, and the audience has lots of different kinds of people, and you don't know where they came from, and they're all sitting there, in, if the performance is good, in rapture, being moved by the emotion of the moment, you get a sense that, you know what? We have a lot in common. And if we ever tried to figure out how we could come together mm. and do big things, that, that art and music can actually incite that. Um, no, matter, no matter what the disparities are. No matter are. what the disparities are. Um, and so when I was Lieutenant Governor, I actually did a partnership with the Kennedy Center to try to put art and music in every school uh, in the state of Louisiana. And that went on for a while, but it slowed down. Unfortunately, I just read the governor, the governor of Florida um, zeroed out the budget for art and music in Florida last week, 32 million bucks. Um, and uh, in our great nation, we spend a little bit of money on investing in the arts, but the city of Vienna spells, spends more money than the entire United States does on investing in people uh, like who are here today. And um, in the work that I did uh, across the country, you hear, you hear basically the same theme over and over and over again. Young men like him, artists like Jasmine Ward, artists like Terrence Blanchard, what they say to you, and this goes into some of my other work on race, is that out here in America, um, talent is equally distributed, but opportunity is not. And you must wonder to yourself that if, if that is true, and I believe it is, how many more people are out there that have not been given the tools that they would need or require to produce and to create the things yeah. that will actually save us and give us the joy and give us the tools that we need to do our work. And so, um, although I did not go into professional theater, it's something that I, that I, that I missed terribly. It was a great education yeah. for me, um, having to read all the classics, having to go through all the work, using uh, the, the words and the thoughts of poets. Yeah. Um, and I've mentioned this to you before, that if you really want to know what's going on in the world, ask the poets and the playwrights. They will tell you in real time what the people of the country are feeling in any particular time. And that could be rap artists, it could be opera singers, people that are writing plays. And you find in all of this work, which by the way, uh, courses across generations and, and, and courses across space, yeah. Amazing Grace, written back in the 17th century. All of us know that. Um, John Dunn's poem, No Man is an Island Unto Himself. Today, people still 
remember that. Robert Frost stopping by the woods on a snowy evening. There are miles to go before we sleep, indicating that we still have a lot more work to do. Even people that do not do this professionally or are, are impacted by the written word or, or, the, or the song, um, and, and, and it's important to everything that we do. It, to me, it's like there's an overt and a covert thing in this. The, the way that art actually infiltrates our lives can sometimes be quite pointed. Um, we talked a little bit earlier about musical theater, how sometimes the songs themselves, the lyrics, are instructive and they get into you and it's, it's a refrain, it's memorable, it takes you to a place over and over again. We know that from our songs, from our poetry. Uh, but there's also simply the storytelling of our times. Uh, you mentioned Isabel Wilkerson's cast. Ava DuVernay did an extraordinary movie uh, uh, called Origin. If you haven't seen it, you should see it and you'll hear Chris's music. Uh, he composed the music for that, among many other wonderful films. It's a narrative that takes you to a yeah. place that simply reading the data does not do. And well, it also gives you incredible inspiration. In, in, the, in the work that I did, I was, I was trained as a lawyer, and I practiced law for a long time, but I got stuck in the government um, as a legislative lieutenant governor and mayor. But it, it, the, the words of John Dunn inspired me when I was working on violence reduction in the city of New Orleans. No man is an island unto himself. We're each a part of the whole. I'm going to get to the end of it and say, and say um, every man's death right, is important to you. So do not ask for whom the bell tolls, it tolls for thee. And the idea that, that just cuts across time and cuts across space is that not only do we all depend on each other, but we're all important to each other. And so in the work that I was doing, when young men were being killed in the city of New Orleans and people weren't paying attention, that point kept coming back to me over and over again because it occurred to me that if a beautiful person like Chris can come in and do all the great stuff and his life matters, the absence of his life must matter too. Hmm. So every man's death diminishes me. Do not ask for whom the bell tolls, it tolls for thee. It's your loss just as, as much as the person who was killed. And that continued to inspire me to kind of do more work. Stopping by the woods on a snowy evening, you get exhausted with the work, you want to rest, it's beautiful, but you know, there are miles to go before we sleep, which means we got a lot more to do. So we got to get back to work because as wonderful as it might be in the moment, there's really trouble on the horizon. You have to keep going. Um, you'll never walk alone. One of your great, if you want, ne haven't heard anything in your life, go listen to uh, this wonderful woman sing, you'll never walk alone when you walk through a storm, keep your head held high. Essentially, we're here all in this together, which gives you hope and inspiration when things get really dark, like when your city gets destroyed by a hurricane and 1,800 people were dead and 250,000 homes were destroyed and you feel like laying on the ground and crying, you put that song on and you get a little pep in your step and you know that you're not, you're not there. By, and I think that that happens to all of us. And I just think that what a, terrible, what a terrible tragedy it would be if we didn't continue to invest just like you plant seeds and water it, why, you, why would you expect it to flourish yeah. if you don't nurture it like you nurture everything else? I think that's, a, that's an underlying serious hope. That sense of you know, talent is evenly distributed, opportunity is not, is so clear. And it's about opportunity that even you know, in your story, you had the opportunity to engage with art, even though it didn't become your, your, your first, first job, if you will. It was part of your life that took you forward. And we think about, I mean, that's why I believe in that at every intersection. I believe that you know, in pre-K and K and K through 12, and I believe it in college, and that's why we're trying to go tuition-free at Juilliard because of that, because that talent is not evenly, is evenly distributed, but the opportunity, if you are gonna be that excellent, you have to be that available for the, everybody who can survive and thrive in that environment. Jasmine, Je does anybody know who Jasmine Ward is? Jasmine Ward yeah. is a fantastic, wonderful author. She lives in Mississippi. She's written a ton of beautiful books. You should read her stuff. But I asked her one time, I said, Jasmine, I said, um, I noticed that you grew up in Mississippi, but you went to college out, but you came back. Why did you come back? And she said, I came back because I, I have more work to do. And I said, well, you know, I'm, I'm curious. You're so brilliant. I said, are you like the most brilliant person in the, in the neighborhood that you live in? And she said, no, there are a lot more of me. Hmm. And I said, how many? And she said, a lot. So I just want you to just think about that because it folds into my, uh, the work that I've done on race. Um, I started a not-for-profit called E Pluribus Unum and my team crisscrossed the South because we're trying to figure out how this country can get through 
one of our most challenging problems. Slavery was our original sin. Race is our Achilles heel. The people of America don't like talking about this because we don't know how to do it. And so we're stuck. We're really stuck. And so my team is really trying to figure out how we can get ourselves to the other side. And I would say that, you know, the most important six words in the English language are I am sorry and I forgive you. But we're having a hard time with people acknowledging that anything actually happened. As a matter of fact, we're going through a period in our country where we want to deny it by burning books. And so if there's no rec rec recollection or recognition for what has done, it's a little bit hard for somebody else to say, I forgive you. Hence, amazing grace. <laughs> How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. That was written by a guy who was a slaver who said, you know, I, I, that's not too good. I think I'm going to go on the abolition side. But every every error is redeemable but there has to be some kind of communion and if you can't find that communion then it's a problem and race in america is handed down from generation to generation that's just how it works um and you know so an artist contended with it throughout and it stands i mean when we think about Think about West Side in the moment well, when it's happening. Yeah. In that moment in 1957, Correct. all the different things that are happening in America, that that's the backdrop. Right. And we sang along, as it were, uh, but we're still trying to yeah. move it. We saw, I don't know if anybody saw this, but that Reggie Jackson, who was a great baseball player, was being interviewed the other day. They were, they were commemorating the anniversary of a black-only league. They called the Negro League. And some of the young, younger guys who went on in baseball to be great fans were, were, were trying to get Reggie to be nostalgic and say, Reggie, you came back here. This is, they only let black guys play here. Don't you remember this well? And he said, he, 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 he did not take the bait to go into, yes, it was a great time. I miss it. He said, I don't miss it at all. And he said, because what I remember about having to play in this southern town in an all black league is nobody would let me sleep in a hotel or nobody would let me eat. And he said, no, my, my, my teammates helped me out, mm. you know, but it was really, really hard. And this is a bittersweet moment for me. And I don't really prefer to remember it well, which means it's very searing for us to understand the trauma that, that uh, we continue to go through. And I, I don't really think that we're ever gonna get to the other side if we don't deal with this issue. We have a lot of difficult ones. Many of them are very important. I happen to think this one is the toughest for us. And that unless you kind of confront it, acknowledge it, understand it, go through the painful conversations, you can't get to the other side. So uh, I would tell you that, that uh, what was written in the shows um, by Rogers and Hammerstein, South Pacific. There's a song in that that we'll talk about in a minute. But if you think about Romeo and Juliet and it jumping forward into West Side Story, almost most of the things that we do have to do with people who are other than us not being accepted into our tribe. And uh, that is, in my opinion, counter to what the promise of America is, which is we all come to the table of democracy as equals. And that was a promise that we made to each other, but we've never fulfilled that promise. And unless and until we do that, we're not really gonna realize um, that more perfect union. I happen to think our country hasn't scratched the surface of our greatness. There's no way that we could have because we haven't invited everybody to the table. And I think that everybody knows that. And when you do, we're gonna do better. Are you ready? Here, here. So, so they, he asked me if I wanted to sing. So you've got me s sitting next to the greatest singer. And, and you got me singing next to the greatest composer. They had cold feet yesterday. We were like on a Zoom. So and he I'm, was like, I'm, I don't know. Really? So I'm going to try this. And I yeah. hope it works out. We're going to welcome Chris Bowers back. And we're going to hear This is song. very short, but it's from, the, it's from, it was written back in the 50s by Rogers and Hammerstein in the show South Pacific. It's not some enchanted evening. <laughs> All right. You've got to be taught to hate and fear. You've got to be taught from year to year. It's got to be drummed in your dear little ear. You've got to be carefully taught. You've got to be taught to be afraid of people whose eyes are oddly made and people whose skin is a different shade. You've got to be carefully taught. You've got to be taught before it's too late before you are six or seven or eight to hate all the people your relatives hate 
you've got to be carefully taught. You've got to be carefully taught. Mitch Landrieu. So we're going to close out this session of Serious Hope uh, with a little nod, actually, if some of you may have been here earlier today uh, for the closing of the Aspen Ideas Health, uh, where we had our extraordinary Surgeon General talking, and we also had uh, a wonderful cellist named Joshua Roman talking about his experiences with long COVID, and he finished out with an anthem of sorts. Uh, and we wanted to tip our hat, and we're going to welcome Renee back to lead us. Uh, but you have a role in this, as you'll hear, uh, and we'll all join in. And in that spirit, I wish you all uh, a seriously hopeful uh, Ideas Festival. <laughs> Renee Fleming and Chris Bowers. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you Damien. Thanks. That was so I want you to all join me on the chorus for this. If you know the words, you can sing all of it. This is a, one of the four or five Amazing Graces, one of them universally loved songs that I've done in my whole career. Ave Maria is one, Puccini Ari is one, and this is the most recent one. Written by Leonard Cohen, this is Hallelujah. a secret chord that David played and it pleased the Lord but you don't really care for music do you it goes like this the fourth, the fifth the minor fall the major lift the baffling king composing a hallelujah Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Maybe I've been here before seen this room I've walked this floor I used to live alone before I knew you I've seen your flag on the marble arch love is not a victory march it's a cold and it's a golden oh, hallelujah hallelujah
Lemon, Chris Bowers, Mitch Landrew. Thank you, everybody.